uh, who in some way represent the diversity of the community or the state or the society, uh, and that sometimes it's done by random selection, and sometimes it's done by scientific demographic selection, and sometimes by a combination of the two, but you're ending up, as with a jury, of a group of people who embody the diversity of the community in some way. They are peers. They're not elected officials. They're not experts. They're ordinary people uh, who have, when you look at them, you go, oh yes, the kind of person that I am is represented in there somewhere. They're not a bunch of millionaires like, like our Congress in the United States is. Uh, so you pick a group of people like that. You educate them on what different people are saying about the or to be to examine. Uh, you help them. You give them access to experts so they can they can talk back and forth with the experts, like in Congress or in a Parliament when they have a hearing and they call experts to testify to them. In this case, you have ordinary people uh, who are calling the experts and the partisans and the stakeholders to testify to them. So you can get Greenpeace and Monsanto and go people from those two interest groups and say, okay, you're saying this and you're saying that. What, What's going on here? You know, be able to cross-examine them. Uh, so that's a special thing most of us as citizens don't have access to. Yes. That kind of thing. So we're getting these ordinary people who represent us, who embody our diversity as a collective, to come together, be really well informed, talk to experts, and then be helped to deliberate. Help them hear each other because they'll have different perspectives on whatever they're talking about. Help them think about if we do this, what's going to happen? What are the consequences of trying this option or trying that option? Which they can then report out to the general public, to the media, to the officials. You know, this is a way of accessing the wisdom of the whole on behalf of the whole. Uh, and since there's many ways to do this, there are many forms that have been used hundreds of times around the world. Uh, and in Denmark, the Parliament, the Office of Technology uh, in the um, of Parliament in Denmark, has the capacity and responsibility to convene ordinary citizens to learn about high-tech issues, genetic engineering of foods, you know, the you know outer space exploration, nanotechnology, all of these things which involve the public, but the public usually has little voice on and is very seldom educated enough to know how to vote. They will bring together a bunch of ordinary citizens, give them access to experts, brief them on the issue, and then have them report to the media, mm -hmm. and put through the media, and to Parliament saying, this is what we found, this is what we think ought to be done. Uh, and there was a, several major initiatives in Canada, one that I love most, the uh, largest um, um, magazine, Glossy News Weekly, in Canada. They picked, back in 1991, it's like more than 20 years ago, they picked a dozen Canadians who were scientifically selected for their differences so that together they represented all the demographics, you know, the, the rich and the poor and the black and the white, and the, the native people and different, um, you know, the Quebec people who wanted to secede, you know, the people who wanted Quebec to just shut up and <laughs> follow along, all these different perspectives and types of people were all represented in these 12 experts in negotiation from Harvard to come up to Canada and spend three days with these 12 people to see if they could come up with something, some shared vision about what should happen to Canada. And McLean's, McLean's gave 40 pages of coverage in one issue called The People's Verdict, uh, describing each of the people and you know, showing a picture of them and why they were selected, what they believed, what their lives were like, uh, and then describing step by step, day by day, hour by hour, what happened in the conversation with pictures of what these people were like as all this was going on. They had you know, a day and a half to two days of very contentious discussions and then breakthroughs, major breakthroughs. And on the last day, they created, <clears throat> they created their statement. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were further articles about how these people were selected and what kind of process was used and historical background on the issues they were talking about, et cetera. Monumental issue. It really, really informed people and got people stimulated to talk about everything that had gone on in this. It was also filmed by Canadian TV and an hour-long documentary came out on their national television the same week that this issue of McLean's came out. <clears throat> so that was that was engaging an entire country 
and talking about, you know, like, how should they deal with the indigenous people? How should they deal with Quebec? You know, how can they, how can they pull themselves together because all the different provinces in Canada didn't know much about each other. So it was like a very interesting trying to pull people together. Unfortunately, they only did it once. If they had done it every year, Canada would be a very different country now. But because they only did it once, the politicians were able to sort of put oil on the waters, quiet the discussions down. Uh, but it was, it's, it's never been done. I've never seen anything like that done again as a media intervention. You wouldn't have to have the government do this. So they also had a, Canada also in British Columbia, had a, a model session that had a man and a woman picked at random from each of their legislative districts. Mm -hmm. uh, and that added up to 158 people that had no indigenous, no, um, none of the Indian populations there. So they picked two, a man and a woman from the indigenous population uh, to be part of it. And that's like 160 people who met every other weekend for almost a year uh, to try to advise if them was good for them. So what else should be, what alternative was there? And they studied this issue and had hearings all over, all over British Columbia. Uh, and they took, took what's called white papers. People who had ideas about what should be done, wrote them up and submitted them. Uh, they, I think they had 1,200 of these white papers submitted to them. So these people did lots of work. And then in the end, 98% of the people who were part of this, what was called a citizen assembly, came to a conclusion about what they thought the electoral system should be like in British Columbia. Uh, and that was put to a vote. Unfortunately, the, the uh, major media, the elite media and the government were against what the people came up with and lobbied heavily against it. Uh, and it got like 57 or 58 percent of the vote, but it was necessary to get 60 percent in order to be adopted. That was in the legislation that established this this uh, a citizen assembly. Uh, so, but it, in terms of that as a model, again, picking people who represent the diversity of the community, educating them and, and having them be able to get information they need, hearing from everybody, and then coming up with conclusions. And in this case, it was very empowered because the public did have the opportunity to uh, to actually vote for and accept what this uh, group had come up with. So I think, hey, you could use those. That same model could be used before an election. That same model could be used to evaluate the performance of candidate uh, of politicians, or to evaluate the performance of a corporation. You know, that's the same model could be used for all sorts of things. Um, and we sort of provide a vision of that in the things that we write and promote. Uh, unfortunately, they're relatively expensive to convene. Uh, and, so, and so we're also doing research on how could we do that kind of thing more online uh, in ways that would cost a citizen jury or a citizen assembly or a consensus conference, all these different methods that are similar to each other, you know, that are face to face. You know, how could we do something online that would approximate that level of rigor and legitimacy, but be much more easy to convene and carry out. Uh, but a lot of our work is centered on that kind of democracy, uh, that dimension of democracy. And that could be used to, in a uh, direct democracy system, it can be used in a representative democracy system, and it could be used to totally replace <laughs> any of those, you know. Back in, back in, um, in uh, ancient Athens, there was a, an institution called the Boule, B-O-U-L-E, that had like four or 500 citizens picked at random each year, and they formed like a Senate who decided, created policies which were then voted on by the people in the assembly, uh, which any, any citizen could participate in, any citizen being the, you know, male members of the community that weren't slaves, you know. Uh, it wasn't a, a full franchise, but at least there were they were, you know, it was conceptually all the citizens participated in the assembly. But the things that they voted on came from this randomly selected group of people. So we could have in the United States with a randomly selected group of people, four or five hundred people, uh, and give them powers comparable to what the House of Representatives had. And maybe have them serve three year terms. They don't get reelected. There's no issue of, you know, money in politics. Uh, and they could do many citizen deliberations simultaneously if they had 400 people 